Week one is in the books, but it's not too late to get closer to the game you love with DraftKings One Week Fantasy Football. This Sunday, DraftKings is hosting a free contest with a hundred grand in total prizes to celebrate the launch of their new game. Pick 'em. Just use code REPLAY to play in DraftKings free contest with a hundred grand in total guaranteed prizes this Sunday. It's free. Why wouldn't you try? DraftKings.com code REPLAY. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. This is the best of Mike and Mike podcast. Mike podcast. Subscribe now by going to the Listen tab in the ESPN app. The best of Mike and Mike. Back and better than ever, Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guests on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. All right, here's the deal. Roughly three weeks ago, the Cleveland Indians were 13 games over 500, and they had a run differential of plus 118. In the roughly three weeks that have ensued, the Indians are 20 games over 500 with a run differential of plus 102. It is one of the greatest stretches of baseball the game has ever seen. And Golick is basking in the glow. He's trying to change record books. I don't know what's going on. Oh, there's a lot going on. Sequestered himself in a room with Hembo, and I don't know what you two of you have cooked up over there. There, there, There's a lot cooked up here, but the bottom line is the Indians are 20 wins. They tie the 0-2 A's with their 20 straight wins. Next on the list uh, for them is going to be the 1935 Chicago Cubs, who have won 21 one they have won 21 games in a row. And I'll be honest, Greeny, I'll just say it right now. I'm not acknowledging the 1916 New York Giants 26-game winning streak. Yeah, that's that's what I'm talking about. Go look. I don't know no. what happened, but for the moment I've gotten here, he and, and Hembo have locked themselves in like a little room, and he is trying to dismiss the 1916 Giants. Can I just say, after my argument... You will agree with me. Okay. So I look forward to that. Okay. I think that right now the Indians' biggest problem is not the 1916 Giants. It's the 2016 Cubs who beat them in seven Mm -hmm. games in the World Series. That's the one you need to get over. The last time the Indians lost a game, which was August 23rd, McGregor and Mayweather had not fought yet. Not a single college football game had been played. Kyrie Irving was still on the Cavaliers. <laughs> uh, it, that, that, that feels like four teams ago. You know what I, I would like to know if, if I were there and, and those close to the team? There have got to be some incredible superstitions would be the wrong thing, but guys doing the exact same thing. I mean, no, no. baseball lends itself because of, of the number of games to superstitions, to doing the exact – this has to be – ridiculous what's going on right now with some of the players and what they're doing. Well, settle in, because you're going to hear Terry Francona talking about just that in just a moment. But let's start with off the top. And again, it starts, of course, with the Indians, who beat the Tigers 2-0. Their win streak is now 20 games and counting. Yeah, really impressive. Seven team in baseball history and four team in the modern era to win at least 20 games in a row, joining the 1916 Giants, who I will discredit very soon, 1935 (laughs) Cubs, 2002 A's uh, as well. And here's the deal. So Corey Kluber pitched last night. There's another shutout. This time Tuesday, they shut out the uh, the, the uh, Detroit Tigers two times, two games in a row. Now seven shutouts during this 20 game streak. It's been amazing. And, and here's here's what you do is you start looking at. They have set what 17 games left. Yeah. People are wondering about a 37 game winning streak because they only face one pitcher who has an ERA below four. That's it. And that person has only had four starts. So they're not facing any great pitchers. They're not going to win. They're not going to win 37 in a row. But that's always the fun stuff to bring up. But they are on a tear right now, and they are one away from the legitimate record of the 1935 Chicago Cubs. Boy, there's a lot of buildup to this discrediting yeah. of the 16 Giants. Oh, and you're going to agree. You will say... A win streak. You will agree with me. I'm looking forward to it. Let's see what you got after this. The Dodgers beat the Giants 5-3. So, hallelujah, the Dodgers finally won a game. They have the best record in baseball, and they had the longest losing streak of the season. It came to an end last night. Kershaw pitched well. Remember his last outing, he got drubbed in just over three innings. So he pitched well here. Six innings, gave up just one earn while striking out six. The Dodgers also clinched a playoff spot for the fifth straight season, extending the longest streak in franchise history, and it was Kershaw who did it. So that 11-game losing streak is snapped, the longest losing streak 
in franchise uh, since the franchise record 16 game losing streak in 1944. Off the top. All right, Johnson and Johnson is usually something we associate with the Jets. Now we can attach it instead to the Arizona Cardinals. Down goes David Johnson as he's going to go on IR with the wrist, and so the Cardinals re-sign Chris Johnson. Oh, I mean, remember, this guy came into the league. He was in the league 10 years, ran that 4-240 uh, in the combine, was fast first six years in Tennessee, 9 rushed for over 2,000 yards, you know, had the, had, had the league, you know, uh, by storm with what he was doing, and then he went to the Jets for a year. I remember it well. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He doesn't. Uh, and then he went to Arizona, where he where he was later in the season. He broke his fibula, so he went on IR. Comes back the next year, and then there's the emergence of David Johnson, who is going to have the surgery and may will be maybe back. They can put him on IR, but he can come back. They're looking maybe between Thanksgiving and Christmas for him to come back. We'll see with Chris Johnson, who was basically the last cut this year and the last cuts that went on. He was basically the last player cut before the uh, Cardinals start of the season. And finally, the the Lakers announced they will retire Kobe Bryant's jersey twice, one time, which is to say they will retire both of his jerseys, the number eight that he wore for 10 years and the number 24 that he wore for 10 years. They'll do both of those on December 18th. He'll be the only player with two jerseys retired. He he made the switch following the 2005-2006 season, and basically... The numbers are, are almost identical. Ten years in one, ten years in the other. Ten all-star selections at number 24, eight at number eight. Seven all-NBAs all at number 24, four uh, with number eight. But as far as points and assists, they're almost right on to one another with each jersey. So both jerseys going to the rafters. And Off that is what everyone's top. talking about, which is brought to you by Dave and Busters. Watch the games and play the games at your football headquarters, Dave and Busters. All right. You've got my attention. Mm-hmm. I am dying to hear it. How are you going to discount the longest win streak in baseball history, which belongs to the 1916 New York Giants? Yes, uh, it, it really doesn't. And with apologies to these guys and their families, with apologies to the likes of Heine Zimmerman, Heine Stanford. Wait, wait, hold on a second. They had two Heines? Two Heines. Two guys, their name was Henry, but they were Heine. Heine Zimmerman, Heine Stafford. They had a guy named Heine Zimmerman? Heine and Heine Stafford. And also Ralph uh, Stroud, who was Sailor Stroud. They had Sailor Stroud? Yep, yep. George Kelly, who was High Pockets Kelly. High Pockets Kelly? That sounds like a, like, Kelly. A, like, a, like a guy in a mobster movie. Yeah, yeah, it does. William Parrott, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but Paul Parrott. And Harry, is it uh, Sally, S-A-L-L-E-E? Slim, Slim Sally. So they had Heine Zimmerman, Heine Stafford, Sailor Stroud, High Pockets Kelly, Paul Parrott, and Slim Sally. There you go. Is that why you're discounting them, just because they had no, goofy names? I'm saying to, with apologies to them and their families of what I'm about to do. They are on record. Longest winning streak mm-hmm. in modern era. Yeah. 1960 New York Giants, 26 in a row. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Sure. So when you think 26 in a winning streak, what do you think? In those 26 games, what did they do? They won 26 games. In a row, right? Yeah, of course. Point of order. Point of parliamentary procedure. Parliamentary, but go ahead. Whatever. Yeah. A point. This team, they won 12 in a row. They tied. Oh. And then they won 14 in a row. That is not a win streak. That is a 26-game unbeaten streak. Not a win streak. So not only should they not have the 26-game win streak as a record, their win streak shouldn't be even near the top. It should be, in the record books, a 12-game winning streak and a 14-game winning streak. And if you want to say a 26-game unbeaten streak, okay, I'm fine with that. But it is not, I repeat, it is not a 26 game winning streak. Well, actually, you're, you happen to be a 1,000% right. Right, I am. And now that you've told me what this is, they've put it up on my screen. Uh-huh. On September 18th, they, they tied the second game of a doubleheader. The game was called after the top of the ninth inning at, with a score of 1-1, to presumably due to darkness. So, so <laughs> which is funny, the, the fact that they're pres- presuming that. But, Why did uh, they just turn the lights off? I remember. Okay. <laughs> you're so funny. Okay, here's the point, though. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. One, wouldn't that make it a 27-game unbeaten streak? Right, the tie would in, would, would, would be would, a game, would, so would, yes, would include that. Yes, so it would be, a, but but it, it absolutely isn't it's not a winning a 26-game winning streak. No, it's not. Twelve games, tie, 
14 games. It is not a 26 game winning streak. And I, you know, they call the game in the 19 whatever the reason did it count or did okay, it Okay, hold count? on. Now the Elias Sports Bureau is disagreeing with you. They say it is the longest winning streak. It's the record for most consecutive wins because a tie game breaks neither a winning streak or a losing They're wrong. streak. They're wrong. They're wrong. If you tie, there's no, there's no win and it's not a loss. So you go to unbeaten, you don't say win. It is not a win streak. They tied. That broke the 12 game win streak. They tied. And then they had another 14 game win streak. So overall, it's a 27 game unbeaten streak. All right, I'm begging you to stop doing okay. that. But, but here is the one thing I would ask. Yeah. Did they make up that game? Did it, did it ended in a tie? They, they, they left it that way. Hembo? Did we, they leave it that way? They, they leave it that way. All right, so so we got to get Steve Hurd on from from the Elias Sports Bureau, and I think we got to go. We got to go toe to toe with him. While you get Steve Hurd on, I'm going to get Golik's hammer okay. because this is going to be solved. You that are way. bigger than Steve. Yeah, he is, I, I, and you know Steve obviously yes, well for years from Elias Sports Bureau. Yes. He was in the yes. booth and all the Monday night games and everything else. We've <laughs> known Steve for years, and he's the man behind the curtain at the I, Elias Sports Bureau. I don't want to hear the time. I would like to have this conversation with lost. Steve. It's got to do something. It's got to mean something. They didn't win twenty six. Six consecutive games. I actually agree with you. They, Thank you. It is a 27-game unbeaten streak, go. but it is not a 26-game win streak. And within the 27-game unbeaten streak, they had a 12-game winning streak and a 14-game winning streak. Now, it might change my perspective yeah. if that game ended in a... T- if, if it, there was a tie there that they then finished later in the season or didn't. something like that. But, but that game ends as a tie. A tie. So it, it is not a win. No, it's not. It is not a win. Not a win, not a loss. So if, if that, if that came in the middle of a, of 26 games that they had lost, mm-hmm. I would call it a 27 game winless streak, but right. not a 27 game losing streak. No, it's exactly I actually right. think you're right. I am. No, that's not actually. I am right. Well, Elias says you're I, not. Well, Elias is wrong. <laughs> Elias, look at me right now, Elias. <laughs> You're wrong. Okay? Right. okay? My Indians are one away from the true win streak, the 1935 Chicago Cup. Th- this is actually worth talking about. You're darn about. right it is. I-, I will send a note to Steve. He just sent me a note the other day about something entirely different. Oh, you have his number? I, I have his email. The note. I'll call him. Okay, I don't know if I have his number. I want to call him. Let me see if his number shows up on his signature line. Uh, let's see here. Yes, I have his number. All right, Steve. And Steve, you better come correct, my friend. Don't give me this. A tie isn't a win. It isn't a loss. It's just a feel good, you know. No, it's not a win, not a loss. I mean, now you're disparaging Steve Hurd, who did well, nothing here. Listen, this is, is, the, is he part of that statement that was written? I, I don't know that. I mean, I, I, he he owns the Elias Sports Bureau, yes. so I suppose he That's is. Him. Then, yeah. That's him. That, he, he, well, he, he wrote is it. Elias. He, he specific. He personally wrote that. Hemo? That note is from him. That note. That is, is his quote. Is, is specifically from Steve. From Steve. All right, I'll read That's it again. Steve. It is the longest winning streak. It is the record for most consecutive wins because a tie game breaks neither a winning streak or a losing streak because it always gets replayed unless the season ends first. So now what we have to get to the bottom of was in 1916, yeah. would they? it came on September 18th. That would have been the very end of the season. Would they have completed that game if the season didn't end? And does that factor well, in? If they completed that game and they won it, then it would be a 27-game win streak. That's correct. You're right. Mike, I have to say, I hate to say this because... Steve, I quite honestly don't think you're up to the task of I, running a No, no, no. You're not, All right. Right. I, 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 I question your credentials. The Giants apparently had three ties <laughs> that year. Um, okay, this actually is an is interesting right little side note. Far more interesting than I expected uh-huh. it to be. I will give you I'm that. Not just some dumb jock here. Well, yeah, you are. But I mean, I think that in this particular case, you might have a reasonable point. And 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 the Bickler has your hammer. Bickler, go ahead, bring it on up. Bring Good up the hammer. ceremonial Golix hammer once again. In conjunction with our understanding of the meaning of the term Occam's razor, yes. we have developed Golix hammer, which is the principle by which in any dispute between two people, see Hurt, comma Steve, Golik, comma Mike. At the end of the day, the the bigger, stronger one wins. Steve? That's all I have to say, man. <laughs> he banged his hammer. So we will get Steve on the phone. I've got his cell here, so we'll call Steve, and we'll get to the bottom of this, because I actually think it is worth uh, pursuing. Oh, it is. Mike and Mike were presented by Progressive Insurance, and Steve Hurt will join us later, we hope, on the Shell Penzo performance line, if we can find a place for him, because Lord knows we're packed. Oh, no. Listen, I'll bump anybody to get Steve on. Gruden, gone. Herbie, gone. Herm, no, Herm's not gone. We Herm's got, we got Gruden, better. Herbie, Field, yeah. uh, Field Yates. 
Will Bob Field Yates. <laughs> Gone. Will bench press Field Yates. We'll just I, you, have, know what? you know what I wonder, though, quite honestly? Yeah. Will Steve come on? No, Steve will come on. Will Steve come on and face the music of the truth, the truth that dispels his statement. The hilarious part of this is that you are friends with Steve Hurt. You just don't remember who he is. No, I don't. You know Steve, right. and you like Steve. There are plenty of friends I don't like, okay? okay? <laughs> there are plenty of my friends that I can't stand, okay? <laughs> Golick is losing friendships over the 1916 New York Giants, who once Couple again Heinies. featured such, such legends as Heine Zimmerman, Heine Stafford, Sailor Stroud, High Pockets Kelly, Paul Parrott, and Slim Sally. So Love let it be written. So let let it be done. Okay, let's get back to All this right. win streak, though, and let's go at the mics, which is brought to you by Dove Men Plus Care. Did you know that 91% of guys that use Dove Men Plus Care antiperspirant recommend it? So if you're heading to the gym right now, why not pick some up on the way? Here's Tim Kirchin on this win streak. He says it may be the greatest of all time. They've outscored their opponents by 102 runs <laughs> that, in that's pretty good. 20, 20 games. Only yeah. six teams have a better run differential for the season than the Indians have for the last 20 games. It has been unbelievable. The last team to have a run differential like this over any 20-game period was the 1939 Yankees, one of the greatest teams of all time, and the team that holds the greatest run differential for a season, plus 411. That's the company that the Indians are in right now, and it is just breathtaking to watch. This almost by definition has to be the greatest winning streak that any of us have ever seen. Let me add another number to that. During this streak, they have allowed 32 total runs. 20 games. And they've hit 39 home runs. My goodness. I mean, it's, it is it, it really is, all, all kidding aside, and we're having fun with this, even though the Giants' record will be discounted. Um, it, it really is an incredible streak that's going on. You know, here's the one thing. I, it, the, the, the 0-2 A's also won 20 yes. straight games, and th- that's the American League record, and so now the Indians have tied it, mm-hmm. and, and, and they could break it. They have an afternoon game today. Um, the thing I'd be interested in is, a, what was their run differential? Do you happen to have that, the A's uh, run differential? The A's was... Um... Hembo's pointing at you, saying you have it. Okay, I don't see it. Hembo's... Plus 76. 76. It's so, 76. So it's not as good as 102, obviously. But my question is, does that matter? I mean, the objective is to win a game. So obviously the the the, the dominance, would, would that make the win streak, would you separate the win streaks based on run differential? They won their games more I mean, easily. More, more dominating. more I mean, dominatingly. In, in... They, they, the because Timmy A's, just said it is almost by definition yeah. the best win streak we've seen. Well, we all saw 2002. Yeah, we did. The two we of did. us were sitting right here in 2000, well, in a different building, but we were doing the same thing in 2002. So what makes this streak A's, better A's than that? A's actually scored about half a run more per game in that streak, way less run differential. Uh, Indians had a better ERA, 160 to 265 uh, in that one. But, yeah, I mean, the, not only you look at how you're beating teams, but if you're destroying teams, and, and that would be run differential, that has to go into the equation. You know, you're winning 3-2 or you're winning 11 nothing. You know, there's something to just winning and there's something to uh, uh, just destroying your team. There was another. If you are doing that, that, that I would say it is the best winning streak that I've seen. Uh, it, it, it is the, that's the most dominant stretch of baseball and, and that I've seen. One of the one thing they're doing well is they're jumping on teams and this has a lot to do with it. they've outscored their opponents sixty four to twelve in the first three innings during the streak. So they are just jumping on teams. Now forgive me if you said this already. I, I I've looked at some of the stats on this. I haven't have, has looked as much as I normally would. How, how much have they trailed in these twenty games? I, mean, I, how, I don't how, have that. Four innings. Four, four a total innings. of four innings. That's unbelievable. They've oh. trailed for four innings in tw- since August twenty third. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, that is really remarkable. That so really the Indians is. are red hot. You brought up the issue of uh, superstitions. Without, without that, that sport lends itself more to that. And I would imagine in this man, guys are doing a lot of the same stuff. Here's Terry Francona. I got one really good buddy, one of my best friends, but he's notoriously bad luck. Everybody kind of <laughs> refers to him as like the gray cloud. He knows who he is, and I. That's you know you talk about superstitions i will not talk to him he is a text only oh yeah he knows cost me one job he's not getting away again <laughs> i have he's so admit, funny i i'm not a guy of of superstitions and doing that no, but you but, mock me for but, them but you... i would I, listen 
that you maybe one of the reasons is as as far as a win streak is concerned. I mean, I did a lot of the the same things when when I got ready, but I didn't have to. I just it was just kind of my routine, which I guess would be the same thing. But I was never had a long winning streak, and I have to imagine if I'm in you know if I'm the the O seven Patriots and I'm winning, you know, I'm two and O, I'm six and O, I'm nine and O, I'm twelve and O, whatever. You know, that at some point I may start doing the exact same things. We did that in my family, and all we were was fans. The one year the Jets made it to the AFC Championship game, we ate in the same restaurant every single night. That's I ordered right, the yeah. same food yeah. because it was working. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and, and then A.J. Dewey happened, and that was the end of that. Okay, so we will get Steve Hurd on the phone, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, A, because he has the best voice of anyone you'll ever hear. B, because I'd like to, I'd like to actually – I will mediate this. All, I, will, I will be Harold Henderson. All screaming aside and having fun aside, I, I think it is a point. I, I, That's what I'm saying. I think, I think you have a point. legitimate point. I do believe that there should be three different uh, delineations. There should be win streaks. Right. There should be unbeaten streaks. Right. Well, I, and I guess there's only two. So, and then eventually you lose. <laughs> so, yeah. so there, there should be, they should separate the win streak from the unbeaten streak. Right. I yes. understand they have an unbeaten streak, but I do believe that the winning streak is interrupted by a tie. I actually agree with you. I'm looking forward to talking to Steve. The best of Mike and Mike. Golick is also in the midst of a dispute now with the Elias Sports Bureau, and it is an interesting one. And we've got a call into Steve Hurt, and we'll right. get him on here, and we've known Steve for years. And the Elias Sports Bureau recognizes the 1916 New York Giants yeah as having a 26-game win streak, even though they had a game in the middle there right. that was called when it was tied. Yeah, they had a t- It didn't end in right. a tie. That's an important <laughs> distinction. It was a tie at nine innings, and they called it because of darkness. They had three ties that year, and none of those ties were put into their record. So, basically, I disagree with how they went about this. They have their reasoning because the Giants won 12 in a row. They tied. And then they won 14 in a row. They did not, in my opinion, have a 26-game win streak because they tied that game. Elias is saying they didn't recognize the ties. They best, they discounted them. They didn't put the, their three ties, including that one, in their record. So basically, it went nine. It wasn't a less than five inning game, or and it went nine innings. It got called for darkness, and they basically acted like it didn't happen. That's their argument. I disagree with that. They played a nine inning game. It was a tie. I know you don't discount it, but they played it. They played that game. They do not have a 26-game win streak. Well, one of the interesting things that I'd be curious to know is also do the stats from that game count? Like, do Honus Wagner played in that game. If he had a home run in that game or whatever it is he did in that game, did it count toward his season statistics? It's, it's something that we'll get to the – because so rarely does Golik have a beef like this that there actually makes sense. It does. Uh, but we will get to the bottom of that as we continue. Meanwhile, let's get the football conversation started again. Kirk Herbstreit on the way in this hour. And right now it's time for John Gruden. And when the Saints first signed him, it seemed like an odd fit. Mike and I talked about it at the time. And watching that game, and I fully believe both he and Sean Payton when they say that there was no real sideline blow-up between them. But that doesn't change the fact that he does feel a little bit like a square peg in a round hole. What role do you envision Adrian Peterson playing in that New Orleans offense as the season goes on? I think he's going to be a closer. I think he's going to be a guy they lean on late in games. I think they're going to lean on him in short yardage, perhaps goal line. And I think they're going to lean on him on some early downs, first down, second and one to three, to slam it up in there and set up some play action passes. But, you know, if you watch the game, the Saints are missing their starting left tackle. That's significant. They lose their starting right tackle. Max Unger, their center, he missed just about the entire preseason. And the Vikings are pretty good. So, you know, without getting all teary-eyed here, uh, there's a lot to be written yet in the Adrian Peterson file in New Orleans, but he's going to have to get used to sharing the load with two other pretty good backs. So along those lines, before, you know, when you're talking about signing him, how much, putting on the coaching cap here, how much does Sean Payton need to have a discussion with him, a guy that's used to being the man, to now be part of a scheme? What is that discussion like? Well, I'm sure Sean had extensive ex- uh, discussions with him. That's how it goes during these free agent visits. Uh, I'm sure he told him that ball distribution is part of the program here. I mean, we. We have a great quarterback that's thrown for 5,000 yards five times 
and we're not going to hand the ball off every play. We're going to keep Drew Brees at the forefront of the quarterback position. So I'm sure they were uh, pretty obvious, and they laid things out. I don't think they counted on losing both their starting offensive tackles before the first game of the year, but that's football. Mike and Mike and John Gruden, and on the other side, what a performance from Sam Bradford, who has been, I mean, I hate to say this, but sort of a dink and dunk kind of quarterback with extremely short passes. The numbers would back that up, and he was flinging it down the field on Monday. What did you see that was different in the scheme from Minnesota, and what do you think that suggests that their season may look like with Bradford getting off to that start? You know, I got excited studying Bradford prior to the game. I thought he played incredible football last year. I know the sports statistical world has a lot of his passes going 10 yards or less, but Bradford got pummeled last year. Uh, he really did. They replaced all five starting linemen for, for a reason. Khalil's gone. T.J. Clemens is gone. Alex Boone got cut. Brandon Fusco is gone. They couldn't pass protect, and this man got punished a year ago and still threw 20 touchdowns, five interceptions, almost 4,000 yards and broke an NFL record for completion percentage. And he had his offensive coordinator resign in week seven. And he just got there a week before the season. So Bradford can play. When was the last time he was in a premier situation? You know, he, he was drafted by the Rams. That was a bad team. He was a young quarterback. Then he went to Philadelphia and played in a, No huddle, never seen before offense. Then he gets traded the week before the season. I think what you're seeing, make a long story short, is Sam Bradford finally in a destination where they've got a pretty good offensive line, an incredibly talented young back, some emerging receivers, and one hell of a defense. So let's go there for a moment because I highlighted that offensive line yesterday, and and you just mentioned, again, five new starters. First, I'd like to know if you've ever seen that in your career coaching where the next year you come in with five brand-new starters on the O-line. They were dead last last year in rushing. I love the outside zone scheme with the speed of Dalvin Cook. So first, from that standpoint of just meshing five new guys together from the following the, the previous year. No, I've never seen that. We never did that in the preseason game. I mean, that's (laughs) unbelievable. And and when you look at the Vikings play their four preseason games, uh, these five starters that you saw play on Monday night had zero reps together. There were bits and pieces where they played one at a time or three or four at a time, but they hadn't played one collective snap together until Monday night. Credit Tony Sperano, the line coach. Riley Reef, he moved over from right tackle to left tackle where he played in Detroit last year. And Mike Remmers, and, and you have to give uh, them an incredible amount of credit, the rookie center to boot. Mike and Mike and John Gruen, I hope I didn't just lose the phone there. Did we just lose John? Oh, I'm here. Okay, oh, okay, good. Thank you. John Gruden is with us there. I thought the, the phone died for just a, a brief second. Let's look ahead to your game. This coming week will be the Lions and the Giants. And I want to lump both the Giants and the Seahawks into this question, John. I asked it to several people yesterday. I mean, their offensive lines looked just awful in week one. The Giants, who we sort of knew that was going to be a problem coming into the season, it manifested itself in every way that it possibly could Sunday night against the Cowboys. And similarly, I thought for uh, Seattle in Green Bay. Is that something that can get better as the season goes on without changing personnel? What, what do you, let's look specifically at the Giants because that's who you have this coming Monday. What can they do to make that offensive line more effective uh, as they go through their season? Because right now it looks like an Achilles heel they couldn't overcome. Well, that's a complex question. I, you know, I, I've always thought that the up-tempo, no-huddle operation that they like to use with Eli Manning is tough on an offensive lineman. I mean, put yourself in Eric Flowers' shoes. You're a left tackle. You go to the line of scrimmage. You never know who to block. You don't know what the play is because Eli Manning is going through all these dummy snap counts and code words to try to decipher what play to get to, and then, boom, six seconds before the ball is snapped, you, you get the play, and then you got to get a call, and then you got to get a block, and it's one play after another. It's hard. And remember, there's a lot of line play right now that's not very good. I trace that back to training camp. Watch the Bengals play. Watch, you said Seattle. Some of these teams have a lot of new players. 
The Lions have a new left tackle. They've got a new right tackle. They've got a lot of new parts. It's going to take time, and if we don't practice hard and we don't put the pads on very often, good luck. And speaking of new players, Deshaun Watson, all signs point toward him very likely getting the start tomorrow. How do you go about that with a rookie quarterback? He goes in for the second half of the game last week, short week of preparation, and then you may be going with a rookie quarterback. Oh, well, you might have to talk him into starting after watching their offensive mm-hmm. line play <laughs> last week. I mean, they gave up 11 sacks. Clayus Campbell had four. Uh, you might not want to show him the film from last week. That, that was a hor- horrific start, but... Man, Cincinnati needs this game. They're coming off a bad performance, and they've got a pretty good front. I just think you got to really simplify the game plan, have a pretty solid protection plan, and put some bootlegs and some no-huddle things in where Deshaun is completely comfortable because this is a tough order going against the Bengals on a short week. Both teams not feeling good about themselves. T- take us back to your experience with him at the, at the quarterback camp and everything else and all of your um, preparation for him leading up to the draft. You know, for those who don't remember, and it feels like so long ago already, you know, your thoughts on him, your expectations for him coming in, because one of the many things that we, I, I remember everyone saying was he's the most ready because of the experience he had in college. He's the most ready to start playing immediately. Well, he does have a lot of playing experience, Mike, but he hasn't been in and out of a huddle. He hasn't really run a diverse scheme, meaning they don't change personnel often. Uh, They don't have a lot of sophisticated snap counts and audibles. So I'm sure Bill O'Brien, who comes from New England in a really incredibly sophisticated world of offense, is trying to make the transition, teach him what he wants him to do, and at the same time, He's going to have to perhaps do some things that Deshaun is already comfortable doing. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some no-huddle offense Thursday night. John, because there's only 16 games, there can be a lot of overreaction each and every week. And going back to the Thursday game, which seems like about a year ago, should there be some uh uh-oh in New England, uh, losing at home, a place they're so used to winning and, and being beaten the way they did in the fourth quarter? Any kind of lasting effects from that in your mind? Certainly. You know, I think Bill Belichick said a couple of years ago, and I agree, the, the first three or four games of the regular season are an extension of the preseason. When you played, Mike, when I coached several years ago, our players actually had two-a-day practices, pads, and, pra- and played quite a bit in the preseason. When you look at the, a lot of these teams, many of these players didn't play more than 35 or 40 snaps the entire preseason. So they really don't know what's coming out of the bag, these coaches. They really don't know what's going to show up. And a lot of these teams have no continuity, and New England's one of those teams. There's a lot of new players playing key roles that really haven't done that as Patriots. So it's going to be, I think, a little bit of time before we see exactly where they go. Mike and Mike, John Gruden with us again. Lions-Giants is the Monday night game this week. Lions had a really uh, interesting game this past week against Arizona where they turned Carson Palmer over repeatedly, and then Matt Stafford did what Matt Stafford does, which is throw a bunch of touchdowns in the fourth quarter to win the game. As you're looking over the tape of that game, what are you seeing from Detroit? Well, they hang in there. It's a credit to Coach Caldwell. They didn't play real well in the first quarter. They fell behind, heard some boos, but... You said it. Matt Stafford, he doesn't get enough credit for his scrambling ability, his ability to push the ball down the field from all kinds of different platforms, people underneath his feet. Uh, He's got to reset. He's got to make some difficult throws. He does it without any running game. I have not seen the Lions have a good running game in a long time, but they leaned on their quarterback. And their defense is better than people think up front. They can rush the passer, and they have a very opportunistic secondary. I like uh, Glover Quinn a lot at the free safety position, and they've added D.J. Hayden, the ex-Oakland Raider, and they get Quandre Diggs back to play the nickel corner. And with Darius Slay, that's a formidable outfit. I can't wait to see the Lions secondary go up against the Giants. I just hope Odell Beckham plays. 
It's the Lions and the Giants in New Jersey. We'll see if Odell is there. We know John and company will for Monday Night Football. Thank you, John. Talk to you next week. Thanks, John. All right, guys. Have a good one. John Gruden with us every Wednesday on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Get instant gold status at Shell. Join the Fuel Rewards program now at fuelrewards.com slash gold. I share that feeling with John. Regardless of what team you root for, I want to see Odell Beckham yeah. on the field. He's the most exciting player in the National Football League, and it would be nice to see him in the nationally televised spot and just in general. And I think they will look how different will their offensive line look? How different will their whole offense look because he's on the field? Well, I mean, again, it depends on the play call. You either you can hit him deep on plays where the, where you got to block a little longer or you can hit him with a slant and he goes 80 yards where you're getting rid of the ball quick. I get what John's point was about the O-line in their scheme where Eli is trying to get a read on the defense of what he has before he calls the play. And then, as he said, you got six seconds to determine who you're going to block him and block him. The other side of that, I'll say it's pro football. I mean, if you can't do that, then you can't play. I mean, that, there are a lot is of... Is every team doing no, 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 some not, variation? No, not, not, not every team is doing that. But then I would say on the other side, if your offensive line is struggling and that's a reason, then you damn well better change it. Then as a coach, you better get out of that and say, you know what, I like running this, but if I don't have the personnel that can do it, then I can't do it. You know, and that's a decision Ben McAdoo has to make and has to decide. But, you know, there are absolutely – they're not the only team where an old lineman has to make a quick few-second decision on who I'm blocking, what the scheme is, and what I have to do. you got to do it. That, that's your job. You know, you have to decipher who you have to block, and you got to block them. I mean, that, that's part of being a pro is knowing what your responsibility is. And if the responsibility is too much in that case for linemen, then – it, as I said, it's incumbent on the coach to to get them out of that. And they're playing a defense that's better than people think. If you watch the Lions play defense this past week, they had a defensive touchdown. They should have had two. Haloti Nada had a ball right in right, his hands that he would have run back for a touchdown. It would have been a, another defensive touchdown. What they intercept Carson Palmer three times? I believe um, three, yes. So the, the, their defense is pretty good. And, um, and Matt Stafford, if you watch that game, and you emerge from it th- still thinking Matthew Stafford is not worthy of every penny they pay him. That I don't know what you're watching. I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. That guy is the whole offense. Um, they don't have Calvin Johnson anymore. They don't even try. They don't even pretend they're going to run the ball. He just stands back there and flings it. And in the fourth quarter, when they wear teams down a little bit, he just he's just phenomenal. And I know that he makes some mistakes. And and people will always say, well, they're always coming from behind because they're always losing. Yeah. Because they, I, I get it. But at the end of the day, they win because he makes big plays late in games every single week. He does. Week. They're, they're never out of it, and that's what you have to recognize when you're facing them. Even if you get a lead on them, you know that they're, they're captain comebacks. All right, we still have a lot on this on this game that didn't count. We've got people defending Elias. We've got people defending Golik. Golik's hammer is being questioned this morning. <laughs> you're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. So much good college football stuff going on. Let's jump right into it here with Kirk Herbstreet, his regular weekly visit with us. College game day will be in Louisville for number three Clemson and 14 Louisville and another great performance uh, or, to, or great start to the season by Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Mike was just breaking it down for you on ESPN2. Good morning, Kirk Herbstreet. Good morning. How you guys doing? Doing well. Great. I want to start with the game that you guys had on Saturday night, which was fascinating, Ohio State and Oklahoma, and I was extraordinarily surprised. At halftime, I was positive Ohio State was going to win that game because Oklahoma so thoroughly dominated the first half and just couldn't, couldn't nothing on the, on the scoreboard reflected it. And then the second half happened and Baker Mayfield happened. How would you describe that performance by the quarterback, by the team, and, and what do you think that sets up for Oklahoma potentially for the rest of this year? Well, first, I think you have to recognize the job that, that Lincoln Riley and, and Mike Stoops with the defense, just the, the preparation that Oklahoma had. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it was the loss to Ohio State a year ago. You know, They had won 10 straight. There was a lot of buildup during the week about uh, Baker Mayfield uh, referring to uh, Ohio State beating them in Norman. And I don't know if you, if you guys have watched Baker Mayfield closely in the last three years, but 
it's not like, wow, who's this Baker Mayfield? That's kind of who he is. He, he's, he's incredibly competitive, kind of a chippy guy. It's how he just, it's just how he plays the game. And so I wasn't necessarily surprised by his performance, but I was really surprised by the youth around him and the way they played with such maturity. And they were, like I said, they were just so well prepared. There wasn't anything that surprised them. And so it really paid off. They probably could have won by even a larger margin if you think about the first half and, you know, going forward on fourth down a couple times and that type of thing. But they, they dominated the game. They deserve all the credit. Uh, Lincoln Riley is both a head coach and a play caller, had his team ready to go. And Mike Stoops, you know, th- this is a guy that maybe 10 years ago was known as one of the deans of the, of the defensive side of the ball. And for whatever reason, Oklahoma's just kind of gotten away from being that dominating defense in recent years. And it's the best they have looked at the two, at the corner spots and just with the kind of the aggressive attitude uh, for four quarters. It's the best they've looked in years. And now the question for me with Oklahoma is clearly by their emotions after the game, they wanted to win this game pretty badly. Can they maintain that energy? In the past, Oklahoma was a peak and valley, a peak and a valley type of type of team. They need to be consistent. That can't be their season beating Ohio State. It needs to be one hurdle of 12 or 13 or 14 games. Um, so I want to see how they react uh, to winning a game like that. And if they play with that kind of energy the rest of the year, man, it's going to be hard for anybody to beat that team. Saying with that game on the other side with Ohio State, and, and I don't want to act like I'm just saying it now. I've been saying it for the last couple of years. I, I JT Barrett has not – done a lot to impress me as a passer he never really has and Ohio State has never been in a position where they have to pass themselves back into games but if that's the case Herbie unfortunately I don't think they have a whole lot of other options but that does seem to be an Achilles heel for this team how do you see that going forward well there's talk about should they should they sit him and and play that one of the younger guys and to me at this point I, I wouldn't go there if I were Urban Meyer um you know, if you go back to 14, when he was a freshman and he replaced Braxton Miller, he had 10 days when Braxton Miller went down with an injury, and it's like, okay, uh, we're going to go with you. You, the, yeah, you're number 16. You're starting. <laughs> 10 days to get ready for their first game. And by the end of the year, he, I think he ended up finishing fifth in the Heisman Trophy uh, race that year. He was running and throwing. To me, the difference was what was around him. You know, you had Zeke Elliott as a younger player who was still a very dominant player in the backfield. You had Devin Smith, who was a – uh, you know, I think he still plays with the Jets, but he's a, a guy that could get vertical and get behind defenses that were loading up against that running game. Uh, you had Michael Thomas, who plays for the Saints, who was another guy that could hit a quick slant and go 80 yards. So they had big playability within their passing game to make defenses have to respect that aspect of their game. They've not had that in 15, 16, and now two games into 17. They don't have that. And so... Until they prove, not just that J.T. Barrett can throw, but they have receivers that can make you pay for crowding a line, until they prove that, they're going to face the same style of defense week in and week out. Now, some teams won't be gifted enough athletically to hold up, but when they face teams with equal or better talent, they're going to be, they're going to be in a quandary until they prove that they can do this. And to me, I, I'd expect them against Army this week, UNLV, Rutgers, teams with lesser talent. They're going to go back to just Urban Meyer football, roll up their sleeves, pound the rock, get physical, set up play action off of that to avoid what, Mike, you alluded to when they're in obvious passing situations. The real test will come when, when Penn State comes to town. Uh, then when you'll find out how much they've actually improved. Mike and Mike and Herbie, college game day this week. Another monster game again, as I mentioned, Louisville and Clemson. So here's Lamar Jackson's chance with the huge spotlight against the huge opponent. Give us your sense of, of what we expect there. And, and, you know, Jackson, with the, as I mentioned, with the performances that he's had so far, has put himself right in the middle of another Heisman conversation. Well, not just this year. It's just how that game ended last year and, and the implications of that game. I and mean, that game was built up very similar to the way it is now. And that game came down to the final drive. And if you remember that one of the Louisville receivers on a fourth down play with about a minute to go in the game, they're driving, they're inside the red zone. He catches the ball near the sideline. Instead of cutting back inside to fight for a first down to get inside maybe the the five-yard line, he cuts outside, ends up a yard short, goes out of bounds. And so, to me, this almost feels like like that 
the next quarter. It's like we're going to the fifth quarter because that game was so good last year. And you have so many of the pieces back with Lamar Jackson, Linda Heisman. Uh, he's got some playmakers around him that, that can really make big plays. And then the, the Clemson defense. Uh, you know, they're as athletic and as strong as, as any defense you'll see in college football. And Brent Venables, I would argue the last three years, has probably been the best defensive coordinator in the game. And so to see Brent Venables' defense against Lamar Jackson, I mean, that's what everybody is going to be watching to see and going to the stadium to see. And all I want to – last time I got excited to go up to a Louisville game, it was the same week, it was to watch Florida State. And Florida State went up to up to Louisville – with a very athletic defense, and they got they look like a bunch of fifth graders running around trying to stop uh, Lamar Jackson. Uh, he's the most electrifying quarterback with the ball in his hand since Michael Vick when he was at Virginia Tech. And if you do not corral him, if you do not have leverage on the football, he's going to make people miss and make them look silly. So Clemson did a pretty good job of it a year ago at home, but it's a different game on the road. So how uh, – how that defense plays and how they prevent him from making a big play, if they can do that, uh, that'll probably dictate uh, the flow of the game. A game that was going on the same time as yours, I was there in South Bend as Georgia came up there and brought a nice contingent of fans with them. And I think, as I talked about after that game, their speed on defense really showed, and certainly the rushing attack on offense to get the one-point win over Notre Dame. I know there were some some issues with Brian Kelly and dealing with a reporter after that game, but but on the field, what, how do you assess both these teams as Georgia goes on, obviously, to play that SEC schedule? So, obviously, Tennessee and Florida, Auburn on the schedule, and Notre Dame still, obviously, with Stanford and USC and Miami on their schedule on where these teams are. As you know, it's, it's still early in the season to kind of definitively know where we are with, with all these teams. Um, for Georgia to go on the road and win that kind of game, you talk about a, a boost to morale with a with a, tr- a young quarterback like that to go on the road. And I know his numbers weren't off the charts, but he didn't lose the game in that environment. Um, you can rally around that, and I, I really like the kid's skill set at quarterback. It, it's it's um, you know he can he can throw it. I think he can keep plays alive with his legs when he needs to. So you know, I, I, I like the feel of Georgia, and of course they have the two backs in the backfield. It's going to get a lot tougher for them. You know, once they get into conference play and you went down to some of their schedule and who they have to play still. But with an athletic defense and with the SEC East being wide open, uh, Georgia with that quarterback, uh, right now, they're definitely right in the mix. And you have to say to me that the favorite with the way Florida has looked so far offensively. Um, with Notre Dame, you know, I, I, let's see how they respond to this. Their defense was so bad a year ago. The fact that they're playing and they're running to the ball and, and playing with a little bit of an attitude, I think Mike Elko deserves a lot of credit coming over from Wake to get them to, to be playing with a little bit of chippiness to them. Uh, I like Brandon Wimbush. I'd love to see a little bit more big playability in that backfield. You know, Josh Adams is a physical guy, but if they could find somebody to compliment him in that backfield, um, because much like what you were saying about Ohio State, I really feel like with Wimbush, if they can run the ball – that they're going to get into their rhythm, and, and it's going to make it easier to throw. Um, so we'll, we'll see how they respond uh, after the year they had last year, 4-8. and eight. Let's see how they respond to a, a home loss by a point. He is Herbie, and again, his top four after week two, number one, Alabama, number two, Oklahoma, number three, Clemson, and number four, USC. We'll see if there's a shakeup there with Clemson and Louisville this weekend, and college game day will be there. Herbie, every week with us here on Mike and Mike. Thank you. See Thanks, you next Herbie. week, Herbie. All right, guys. Have a great week. Kirk Curb Street every Wednesday right here on Mike and Mike. I'm really looking forward to that. If you remember that game last year, yeah. he mentioned two Louisville games last year that I remember. The Florida State game was unbelievable. Yes, it was. And I had picked Florida State to win the national mm-hmm. title, so that went really badly yep, for me there. Um, and then and then that game against Clemson, which you know, college football is so good that it's kind of hard to say it was the best game of the year, but it, well, it was it right wasn't, there. It was it awful was close. right there without question. Uh, so we'll see what he can yeah. do. And, and look, there's only, everybody knows there's only been one guy ever to win the Heisman twice in his mm-hmm. life, but Jackson has a really good chance at that. Right now, do you know who the favorite is? You see, I, I got this sent to me yesterday. Do you know who oh, right is? Oh, I did. I, I can't believe I just um, – who is it? The favorite is Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield. After Baker. that performance of the other, other night, and Lamar Jackson is second. We shall see. The best of Mike and Mike. So much that we have working today. But I need to just take one second here. Okay. 
There are certain things people have the ability to do that just astound me. Mm -hmm. Just astound me. The genius that is the human being. Okay. So there are so many things I can't do. Right. I mean, the list of things I can't do is long. It's easier to go to the list of things you can do. But if there's one thing I wish I could do is to be to figure out how to do this. Okay, I'm about to do something. This is real. What you are about to hear is real. Okay, I am about to talk into my phone and you are going to hear it. Siri, who owns Ohio Stadium? It's Baker Mayfield. (laughs) How do they do that? Who did that and how do they do it? How many people have an iPhone? 26 billion? I mean, how many people are there on planet Earth? Subtract nine. Everyone else has an iPhone. Somehow someone figured out how to make Siri say that. I want to know how to do that. How do you do that? It's a great point. I'm with you. That's a great skill. That really is. I have we no need idea. To look into that. If anyone knows how to do, I want to be able to. What's make... that technology? Yeah, seriously. We, did, we didn't learn it. Yes, was it yesterday? The announcement of the of the new iPhone coming out that's yeah. going to be like twenty grand or something like yes, that. Yes, I don't. It's not going to be, not gonna be that much. But like yes, I saw a lot yeah. of people talking about yeah. it like yeah. crazy. But but the point is, that, how would, do you do that? I would have been more interested to hear the answer to that question than to hear about. The I new understand how people whistles. get into Wikipedia sure, and change sure. right. things in there, and, you know, uh, quickly. The, the, you know, the, to to reflect stuff like. How do they do it so it's on all our phones, which, by the way, is a scary thought. How do you make Siri do that? I, I'm not, I have no connection to that game, to those schools, to those no. people. They would not have, have, have you know, linked it to me in any conceivable way. It just works. It's incredible. Siri, who owns Ohio Stadium? Here's what I found. Okay, never mind. I, I, it, it picked up the just works. Ah. But it's still... It's still working. I and mean, you're going to need a new phone after and, that. And now, and now I need to, to enact my Apple uh, yeah. protection or whatever that thing is where I went in and they just gave me a new phone. It was great. But anyway, the point is, how do you I don't make know. Siri I don't do know. that? I, I, I'm with you. I would like to know that as well and that technology. That's the greatest skill ever. Mike and Mike were presented by Progressive Insurance. Last year, over 3 million drivers switched to Progressive. Call a click today. Find out if you could save. Mike, I wanted to just finish up because your, your passion on this subject is, I, I think it comes through the television screen and comes through the the radio speaker. Um, again, the 30 for 30 aired last night about the replacement players. Right. And Golik was one of those players on strike in 1987. And what doomed your union was the fact that the biggest stars in the sport crossed, crossed the picket line. Crossed the picket line. We all, we all walked. We all marched. We were all thought we were in solidarity. And uh, very quickly, it eroded to the point where – by the last replacement game, there were 21 Dallas Cowboys that, had, that were, had crossed the picket line and were playing in that game. After I was at the Houston Oilers then, and I was very pro-union acting during that. That's when I got released. I was, I was starting nose tackle before that strike. And I was very union uh, guy during that strike. And the Oilers, after that strike was over, they expanded the roster so that you could add as many people as you wanted. The Oilers kept every single replacement player, and they were on the practice field with us. Like the Washington Redskins, I think, signed 13 of those guys. You want to talk about fights and being uncomfortable, and all of a sudden I was not only not playing, I was inactive. I went from starting to not playing and inactive. I mean, you think something might have been going on there to where I asked Jerry Glanville, I said, listen, if this is what's going on, just release me. Be careful what you ask for. They did, and that's how I ended up in Philadelphia. But, yeah, it was it made me mad as a guy who was making $3,400 per game for 16-game schedule that I had to hear the guys, you know, complain, oh, I, I, I can't miss my $31,000 check or my $60,000 check, as most of us who weren't making anywhere near that were staying out there and striking for the cause, which unfortunately just absolutely disintegrated right before our eyes and the, obviously the major cause of that. I'm not saying we would have won that fight anyway, but when your top players start crossing the line, you are absolutely done. The opposite end of that is baseball, where the players did win, and they routinely won because they did stay together. I covered spring training the year that they had replacement players in. Major League Baseball had all these replacement players in there in spring training. And it was actually a, a, a judge who was now on the Supreme Court of the United States, Sonia Sotomayor, who ruled in favor of the players and ended that strike, or who knows what would have happened. Right. But they had all these other guys in there in spring training, and I was down there covering it. And the Major League players, 
the the guys who who were um, replacement players who wound up a lot, they, because what the owners did was they twisted the arms of a lot of guys who were in AAA yeah, yeah. and made them show up. They never let them in the union. When they would have their union meetings, right. they would lock these guys out the door. So they stayed together. And there are a variety of reasons for that, including guaranteed contracts mm-hmm. and longer careers and everything else. But at the end of the day, you want to win a fight like that, you have to stick together. Well, you, yeah, yeah. And really quickly, just, just to end this, in 87, it was about free agency. Right. And we didn't win it then. We actually took it off the table. We got free agency in 1993. And before that, we decertified. We got free agency by not being a union. That's how we had the power to get it, by decertifying as a union, getting free agency. And the league actually, as part of the stipulations of it, wanted us to get a union again uh, going forward because they knew they basically could beat us uh, uh, most of the time when we were unionized. We decertified, and that's one of the big reasons we got free agency. So you've got that. Now, if you go to the other side of it, uh, we, we have the current, because most football fans don't care about that anymore. Uh, right. Although uh, the 30 for 30 I heard was really good. It was, really, it was, and it was more, I, I'm not, as far as the 30 for 30, I didn't explain really yet. It was more on the side of the replacement players. The quarterback for the Redskins, Ed Rupert, he was one of the first replacement players. After the first day he left, he felt horrible about crossing the picket line. He left, but then they didn't have a quarterback and he went back. I mean, it was stories about more about those guys than anything else. It was very interesting, but it certainly brought up the other side of memories for me. But for the current, um, issue we have so many people who look at the current collective bargaining agreement and think that the players did a terrible job and they lost and everything else and they blame d smith and whatever the case may be here's the bottom line Mm -hmm. all right so because booger was in here for you one day and he was saying a lot of that and then jeff saturday came in and that was not to to rebut him it was jeff's day and he was in here now jeff was the i don't think he was the president of the players association then because dominique was but jeff was a very high-ranking member of the players union and was involved in all those negotiations and one of the things he said to booger was dude what you have to realize is my phone was blowing up every single day during that lockout with players saying, man, you got to get me back on the field. I don't care what happens. Get me back on the field. I don't care what happens. I'm not missing game checks. Get me back on the field. So the football players aren't going to have it. They're not no. going to sit. No. They're not going to lose those paychecks. And you know who knows that? The owners. No, the owners. Absolutely. And so they have no chance. Yeah. So the, whenever anyone blames the leadership of the union for the deal they currently have, I always say, listen, you're just pointing in the wrong direction. They're fighting an unwinnable and, and, fight. And understand, the, the players have won some things. Listen, that 93, when we fought in 93, the, the, the benefits package greatly improved, greatly improved. Without question from what I – and that was the year I retired, so I, I didn't get any of that, but the guys going forward – did and and the, this last one the players they wanted the off season to start later uh, in, in April they wanted no two days in in uh, camp they got it they wanted less padded practices and they got that so they the, the whole major fight is keep we keep talking about Roger Goodell and his power in Article Forty Six I'm telling you players are not going to miss a game check for that they're not but that's what's going to create the headlines because that's the headlines we have. Player gets in trouble, league gives discipline, union appeals, goes back to the league, union doesn't like that, takes him to court. That's everywhere, but that's not going to be the battle. It's not going to be the battle. The players have gotten some of the things they have wanted, but ultimately, if you're talking about digging heels in, the owners, ultimately, if it's on the same topic, normally the owners are going to win that one. Absolutely. So, you know, all these people who say that, that you know, they – when, you, when you're fighting a fight you cannot win, it's very difficult to expect better results, in my opinion, yep. than what they got. That's just one person's opinion, and I have no horse in the race. Uh, a bunch of Twitter reaction on this. NY Raider tweets, when the big money players crossed, did that cause friction in the locker room with the other well, players? Well, sure it did. I mean, you, you talk about in Dallas. Look what happened soon after. So after the strike in, in 87, look what happened to that team. Tony Dorsett asked for, asked for a trade that next year. He wanted out, and by 89, not long after, who was the owner? It was Jerry Jones, no right. more Tom Landry, no more Tech Schramm. I mean, they were gone, and, and that whole thing. And they were institutions. For those of you Absolutely. not old enough to remember, they were institutions in Dallas and in the National Football League. But, yes, there was. I mean, are you kidding me? Listen, we struck. It, it got contentious. And after the strike, as I said in Houston, they kept every single replacement player. You don't think there was bad blood there? You don't think there were fights that went on there? So in every team, and I don't know each team how many they kept. Like I said, in the, in the show last night, you saw Washington 
signed 13 guys. And they said it wasn't great in the locker room. How, how could you expect it to be? You, the, the, these guys crossed a picket line and continued to play. And they did it for their reason. I'm not going to sit there and bang on every one of those guys. They did it for their reasons. They, all, they, they interviewed a bunch of different guys for their reasons of doing it. I'm not here to judge them about it. But at the time, I know when I'm looking in that locker room and I see a guy that crossed that picket line to be a replacement player, I wanted to punch him. I wanted to get in a fight. That's what we all wanted to do, and it happened out on the field. I mean, it, it was not a pretty thing for a while, no doubt about it. All right, Mike and Mike, all this Twitter that we're getting here through the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed, nothing makes up for your football obsession like a surprise from 1-800-Flowers.com. To order a dozen multicolored roses plus an extra bouquet and a vase for just twenty nine ninety nine, go to one 800 flowers dot com slash ESPN. Okay, little quick um, foray back to my days in journalism school. Okay, one of the things that they teach you in journalism school is headline writing, mm-hmm. which as I as, as I think is more important than ever now, because back in the day, headline writing was meant to make you want to read a story in a newspaper. But generally speaking, I don't know exactly how they calculated this back then, and it's not really the important part of this. You already had the newspaper. You had already bought the newspaper. Now these things are measured in clicks, so I think the headline is even more important than it's ever been. In what I do for a living, we've used it in teasing and trying to get people to listen. Right, and and just for fact, I I didn't go to journalism school. I had always thought when I saw an article and a headline that the person who wrote the article also wrote the headline, and I found out that is that not true. No, editors true. Uh, at newspapers uh, write the headlines. I, I don't know how that works on, on online sites. But either way, the point of this is there is a great headline in a story today that uh, jumped out at me immediately, and that is Coach Marries Player. Now, obviously, you can't have a coach marrying a player. No, you cannot. Regardless of the sport, regardless of the circumstances, you cannot have a coach marrying one of his or her players. It just does not work that way. Except, in this case, it's perfectly fine. At Murray State, defensive lineman Bishop Woods and his fiancée, Caitlin Myers, who welcomed their first child four months ago, were tired of waiting to exchange I do's. So... He told uh, Myers Tuesday morning that he found someone who could marry them. And it happened to be his offensive line coach, Brian Hamilton. Woods found out that Hamilton was an ordained minister, and Hamilton concluded, uh, excuse me, conducted a ceremony Tuesday at midfield of their stadium right after practice. The coach said, it's the life of a college football coach. You get to be a part of kids' lives. It was fantastic for me to share that. That's very cool. That's so this cool. couple wants to get married right after practice. The offensive line coach, who is an ordained minister, marries his player and his player's fiance at midfield right after Very practice. Very cool. Don't see many weddings where the one person is so sweaty, like I'm sure the groom was in this case after yeah, practice. I mean, that's the one way. Would you, would you like? You know, would you now kiss the bride, and the uh, bride no, says, no, "No, not, not right, right now." Yeah, we'll wait on that. Uh, there's another one here. Another headline, by the way, that I like. How about this? How is it possible? That the greatest game ever was never played. The greatest game ever was never played. Okay. You have any guess on what no, I'm talking No, I about? don't. You know who's playing each other this weekend? <clears throat> USC and Texas. Ah. Are you aware that USC is 4-0 all-time against Texas? Wait, Greeny, how could that be? Didn't they have a championship game where Texas beat USC? No, they didn't. At least not according to the NCAA and according to USC. USC and Texas play this week for the first time since their memorable BCS title game in the Rose Bowl following the 2005 season. But per the Trojans' official game notes, they list the Trojans as 4-0 all-time against Texas while acknowledging one loss in that Rose Bowl was vacated due to NCAA penalty. That is because, as their SID SID explained, the program was instructed in 2010 by the then NCAA Director of Statistics not to include participation in any games that year as part of its official records. Mm -hmm. So they not only vacate the wins, they vacate the loss. (laughs) So as far as USC is concerned, that game, which many people think is the greatest game in college football history, never happened. Well, I think that that's good news for me and my family. Now we don't have to say we lost to Alabama in the 2000s. 12 because all that was vacated, was it not? Game the whole season was vacated. Appeal that yeah, none that of their wins count. Wins their, their appearance in that game doesn't count, and thus the loss. Can I give you another doesn't headline? Count. Sure. That is tricky and isn't really true. Yet we have the headline. Go ahead. That that headline would be 1916 New York Giants have the record for the longest winning streak in baseball. 
No, they don't. This is a really good battle that we have going on today. And, and have we heard back from Steve yet? He's coming on. Okay, he's coming on what time? Oh, good. He didn't 9.05. Run. Okay, so at the top of the next hour, we'll have Steve Hurt on, who runs the Elias Sports Bureau and is a great guy. And his is, the I'm position good. of the Elias Sports Bureau is the 1916 New York Giants, who won 26 consecutive games. Right. But sandwiched in the middle, they had a game that went nine innings. Right. Got called as a tie. Right. The game thus ends as a tie. As far as we can tell, the statistics count, but the tie is not counted in the standings. They do not consider that tie breaking up the win streak. So while Golick is arguing it should be an unbeaten streak, right. Elias actually counts it as a winning streak. And I disagree with that. 26 consecutive Those games. Giants, uh, led by a couple of guys named Heine, Heine Zimmerman and Heine Stafford, to go along with a Sailor Stroud, a High Pockets Kelly, a Paul Parrot and a slim uh, uh, is it Sally, uh, with all apologies to them, they won 12 in a row, they tied, and then they won 14 in a row. So that is a 27-game unbeaten streak. And now they did have three ties that year, and Hembo, you're saying those three ties were not put into their record. Correct. They played 155 games, but only 152 games are reflected in the stand. Okay, so that would seem to give them a feather on their side, a check on their side of the argument. Here's where they're going to lose me. And if you're coming on here, Mr. Hurts, and telling me that, okay, they didn't count ca- what? Hurt. Hurt. Go ahead. Well, he's going to hurt. It's not Jalen Hurts. It's Whatever. Steve Hurts. I'm Go sorry, ahead. Steve. Steve, if you're going to come on, the only way I'm going to give this some slight bit of credence is if you tell me those three ties, you didn't count the statistics for the players. If you did, then your argument is garbage as far as I am concerned. <laughs> You can't not count it in the standings, but count it for the player. So if you counted the stats for the player, your argument to me is null and void. I will go like hammer you, and I will win that argument. Even if you say they didn't count, I'm still teetering on the battle that I'm going to have with you, Steve. Yeah, so the, once again, we, we invoke the provisions of the Golix Hammer, yeah. which, again, is a subsidiary of Occam's Razor. Right. Occam's Razor dictates that in any scenario where there are multiple explanations for a phenomenon, the likeliest one is usually true. Mm-hmm. Golix Hammer a is a different. similar principle, yeah. wherein in any dispute between two people that goes on for a prolonged period of time, in the end, the one who is bigger and stronger wins. And thus... Golix Hammer. So if Steve and I continue to disagree, I'm bigger than Steve. You are. Steve's a pretty big guy. No, but I understand you're that, but I'm bigger, so I will eventually win this. But that, to me, is going to be the big thing here. If you didn't want to count the ties in the record, okay. But if you counted the player statistics, you lose me, it's done. Then the, the Indians, to me, are one game away from tying the true uh, best win streak, and that would be the 1935 Chicago Cubs at 121 games. Yeah, for that's for those of you who are wondering why does Gola care about this, because the Indians' 20-game win streak is six games shy of the officially acknowledged record. Golick is arguing they should be able to tie the record with their afternoon game today right. and break it in their next game if they should win this because Golick is arguing the record should be 21. Elias recognizes the record is 26. We'll see where that all winds up going. Um, you want to sneak in a quick next question here? or, or no, We'll save it. We'll, we'll save, save it. it. Let, let, me, let me do one, one thing here to j- just for, from a factual standpoint. You had mentioned we were talking about CBA if Dom- Dominic Foxworth was the president of the CBA. At yeah. that time, Kevin Mawai was the president president of the CBA just Saturday and and Neek were on the executive committee just to be Oh, I, yes, yeah. I have that too. Dominique sent me that email yeah. too here. Yeah. So, yeah, Jeff and I were executive committee members. Right. The president was Kevin Mawai. Right. I'm glad that we cleared, uh, corrected that, but it's not No, it's no, no, a, but we just wanted to get Right, but in this case, I mean, Jeff yeah. was certainly in on all those conversations <laughs> yes. and he was the one who told us here on the air Guys are calling him up every single day. He was getting tons of phone calls from guys. I don't want to miss Look, checks. I don't care what happens. Yeah. I'm not missing checks. And if, if that is the approach you're going to take, and I'm not criticizing you're, those players, hey, but you're fighting for things that will never, or most of them will never impact you. They're, they're, how many players who were in the league then are still in the league now? Jeff Saturday is sitting here doing football with us. Dominique Foxworth is sitting here doing football with us. Kevin Wise not playing anymore. You're fighting for things that are largely not going to impact and you. And here's one of the other differences, though, I will say in baseball and football about, you know, baseball, they strike. Baseball are guaranteed contracts. Yeah. There's a difference in that. Of course. Go, and they have and, much longer careers. Right, right. So I'm talking as far as holding out to get what you want. Yeah. Yeah, your, your, your contract That's is why. guaranteed. I mean, there you are a variety out. of reasons. Right. Um, I mean, the, the players, 
have it better in baseball. Right. I mean, right. in every way you can imagine. Yeah, when you know that money you have is guaranteed and in football, you may be cut the next day and not making a dime. There's a huge difference. In yes, that. and when you're the average length of your career is three years, mm-hmm. and you know that you're not missing out on one of them because that becomes 33 percent of all the money you're ever going to make in your life playing that sport. All right, so people are telling me because Andrea put the made a little uh, video of my playing. The, the thing from Siri, that they take that from Wikipedia, but I can't find it on Wikipedia. I don't see it on Wikipedia. So all the people who are telling me it's Wikipedia, again, if you're, and by the way, Herman Edwards is with us here. Good morning, Herman. Good morning. You wanna, yeah, so, I know you're excited about you're that. You're going to enjoy right this. It really is. Okay, so I give it to me with a toy here. here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for you again here. So this is just me talking to a phone. Siri, who owns Ohio Stadium? Checking out Ohio State. Oh, see, now they've changed it. Oh! At the time that I said it, they changed it. Look what I've done. Who changed it? But who changed I it? I don't know, but it worked when we who just did it 20 minutes ago. Who changed it? How Siri, do they know how to change it? Siri's boyfriend changed it. <laughs> Siri's a boyfriend? I mean, I don't, who's you didn't know that? that? No. Oh, you didn't know that? No. Oh, come on. We're just please. learning all kinds of you things. You didn't know here, that? Come on. This wow. is a very yeah. different kind of day. All right, Mike and Mike, Herman Edwards is here. Let's get down to business. A bunch of different things I want to get into with you today. And let, let's start with you're a head coach. You play week one. Mm. You had a lot of questions going into week one about your offensive line. And the answers as you're watching the film from your week one game come back in the negative in every conceivable way. Let's say, for example, you're the coach of the New York Giants. Yes. What do you do? What, what, mm. what do you do when your offensive line is struggling? Well, uh, you have to bring more guys in to protect. You can't be this quick passing offense that you would like to be in the fact that they can't hold up. Now, who, you know, who, who, who was your competition? Obviously, that has a lot to do with the two. You know, who, who, who did you play? But, but I think going into this, um, you're probably going to have to use the backs a little bit more in protection, maybe even the tight end. Uh, problem with the Giants, too, is that without Odell Beckham, when you line up, you have no one that tilts the field as far as the defense. So when you talk about the Cowboys, a couple things. First of all, the Giants didn't have enough plays. The Cowboys had the ball for almost 35 right. minutes. Mm-hmm. And so now you feel like every time you go out there because you don't have a series of plays, you're almost compelled to say, come on, guys, we got to go because they're keeping the ball away from us. And so when you get into that, as well as there's no one that scares them when they break the huddle as far as the defense of the Dallas Cowboys because Odell Beckham's not out there. So the field doesn't get tilted. So barring injuries or anything like that, when you were a head coach, you had mm-hmm. expectations of your team going into a season, and then after week one, again, barring injuries, losing anybody, did you ever finish week one and go, oh, boy, okay, I didn't see that problem. Well, well going into week one, I, I think a lot of teams don't know who they are, to be quite honest. With, with the way games are being played in the preseason and the practice schedules, I, don't, I think after about week three, you figure out your strengths and your weaknesses. I, 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 I look at week one now and go, you know what? Ah, just kind of put it over there and go, if you win, you're excited. If you lose, you go, okay. Is, is this becoming a continuing saga of the same situation? Okay, that's what you better understand too. And, and if that becomes who we are after three weeks, okay, what are we going to do to change this thing, boys? We, we got to regroup and we got to do some things a little bit different. And I think if you're the Giants defensively, you're good. You're good as gold. You feel pretty good. Offensively, they kind of look like they did last year. That's the fear, right? You know, it's kind of like. Without uh, Odell. How you look last year and then uh, don't have Odell right now. You knew they couldn't run the ball. Right. But you figured, well, maybe they can throw it. Now, look, the Dallas Cowboys are a good football team. Let's just don't take that away from That's the Dallas. That's not a juggernaut defense they're playing by. Uh, no, it's not. Yeah. No, it's not. And that, they're, they're, that, that, that's the concern a little bit with the Giants. Mike and Mike and Herman, you mentioned you give it three weeks. Not if you're Bill O'Brien, you don't. He's, he is a man with a quick hook, and he appears ready to exercise it. He already pulled his starter, Tom Savage, out of his first game at halftime. And while he's not announcing a starter, all signs seem to be pointing toward the rookie, Deshaun Watson, tomorrow night. And what sets up to be a pretty big game between two teams who got thumped in their openers with the Texans and the Bengals. What do you make of the decision, if he is indeed doing it, to go to the rookie this quick? That doesn't surprise me. Uh, I always felt like it, Savage was in pencil only as a starter and how he was going to fare this first game. Now, no one believed it was going to be this. When you look at the numbers, you go, well, you know, I was in L.A. and, you know, I was doing the, the Colt uh, Ram game and 
And I'm watching this thing and I'm going, huh? Is it what is this? No. And I and I turn back around watching some more. I'm going, Woo, this is not good for Houston. And by the third quarter, I'm I'm in the in the booth and I'm telling them, hey, they ought to put the rookie in. They said, Coach, they're not gonna put the rookie in. I said, I'll put him in. I said, put him in. I said, because first of all, they can't block those guys. And at least he can run around and go make some plays and try to make a play. But but I just think now you have to have a a quarterback with, with your situation at the offensive line and they, they you know they, they couldn't protect. You have to have a quarterback that can move. He can at least move. You can move the pocket with him. Savage, you know, he's a drop back pass. He wants to sit in the pocket and throw the football. Well, they can't do that right now. So this was a little bit of a a head scratcher, but then again, it wasn't in this sense. With all the energy that uh, this team and in, in, in this in Houston went through, you know, with the, you know, it's kind of like okay, the emotion of the crowd and all that, and that was really good in the beginning. But then I think it was just so much energy on other things that Jacksonville went in there and got after. Them. So for a guy in you who made a quarterback change on a plane, uh, what what plane, yeah. what yeah. what's the discussion? that Bill O'Brien has got to sit down with Savage alone, Deshaun alone, or them together. I mean, what? then to boot, it's a short week. So this all has to happen pretty quickly. Uh, well, my discussion was uh, I called our – because I was sat in the back of the plane. I was sat in the last row in the back of the plane, and the coordinator sat up front first class. I asked the stewards, can just go get a hack and bring him back here for a minute. And he comes back, and I said, hey. I said, guess what? He looked at me, and I said, yeah, 10. Get him in. He's starting this week. And he what? I said, he's starting. He said, really? I said, oh, yeah, really? Get him ready. And then I brought in Vinny uh, and told Vinny. And I said, Vinny, I said, hey, the way we're playing right now, I said, I could change the left tackle, change a couple guys on defense, nobody cares. I said, but if I change the quarterback, I get everybody's attention. He says, coach, I got it. I get you. And brought ten, and when I brought 10 in, now, I don't know what coach is going to do with, with Deshaun. I said, it's your ball. You go play now. It's your team. I said, the only way you can lead them is win. You don't have to rah-rah guy. When you win games, you can lead these guys. What if 10 was a rookie like Deshaun is? How, how, how would you have treated that? Chad was pretty young. Was it his second year? Yeah, and, yeah. you know, he hadn't played. And, and I just said, don't, you don't have to be the rah-rah guy. You lead by winning. I said, you go win, and then they'll follow you, and I'll help you. And I think he's got to give the ball to Deshaun and say, look, I know your strengths. You've played enough in, in, in the preseason. What do you like? What do you like about this offense? And that's the conversation I'm having with the young one. You want those plays? You got it. And play that way. And the team will go, we got it, coach. We know. And look, these guys watch this competition all, right. all preseason anyway. It wasn't a sh- it's not going to be a shock to the team's like, oh, we're going to start a rookie. They're going, hey, yeah, put the guy in the game. Let's go. Mike, Mike Herman Edwards is here with the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. For those who don't know, the 10 he's talking about That's is the Chad, beloved yeah. Chad Pennington. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about can a, can a, what was the expression, a leopard? Who changes his stripes? Mm. What, what, is it, what, what, what animal yeah, changes his stripes? Yeah, yeah. Alex Smith oh. and Sam Bradford oh flinging it. Flinging it downfield. I mean, one of them was, was I mean, the, the, these are the kings of the dink and dunk, the short pass, all this safe stuff. And all of a sudden on Thursday night in a nationally televised game, you got Alex Smith flinging it all over New England. And then Monday night in a nationally televised game, you got Sam Bradford doing the same against New Orleans. Is that something you expect to see more of? Is that something that you think was dictated by what the defense was giving? Because if so, those are two teams that looked awfully good. They did. Uh, Sam Bradford, we know, was an accurate quarterback. We didn't anticipate he was that accurate throwing the ball down the field because that's not his forte as of late. Now, all of a sudden, that's changed a little bit. And you've got a coach. You know, his, his OC has been with him from the beginning. He was with him when they drafted him with the Rams. So, you know, he, he has been with him. He's in Philadelphia. So he knows he, he groomed Sam Bradford, basically, when he first came into pro football. So he knows his strengths. And, and I think he did a nice job of really devising plays and formations to give him opportunities to throw the ball down the field. Not risky throws by any stretch of imagination. Hey, by the way, Diggs made a couple catches where yeah, it's like, okay, it's 50-50 ball. I'm trusting this young guy. And he goes up and catches the ball. So, you know. Are they still a little bit dink and dunk? Yeah, but he's going to take some shots. And I just think it's all orchestrated by formations and personnel. All right, we're going to keep Herman here. Coming up next, there is a um, – it's a leopard that cannot change its spots and a tiger that cannot change its stripes. Oh, okay. We have these discrepancies uh, regularly okay. here. We know they live in the zoo or in the jungle. <laughs>
<laughs> you got that right, right? Okay. The best of Mike and Mike. Steve Hurt from the Elias Sports Bureau, who's going to join us in a minute. Because Golick has taken the occasion of this mar- this marvelous 20-game win streak that the Cleveland Indians are on, and he's taking it a step further. And candidly, he has a point. I'm not 100% sure which side of this debate I'm going to fall on yet, but I'm going to be a truly independent arbitrator. I'm not going to be Harold Henderson up here just, you know, carte blanching whatever decision it is that you make or Steve Hurt makes. Um, I- I'm going to listen to the evidence on both sides, and I will eventually render a decision. <laughs> on whether or not the Indians can today tie the right. all-time record for the longest win streak in baseball history. Yeah, uh, to, to what we're talking about here, the longest win streak in modern era, according to the Elias Sports Bureau, is the 1960 New York Giants at 26-game winning streak. Now, in my book, a winning streak means you've won 26 games in a row in right. this particular streak. Well, in this streak, they won 12 games in a row, then they tied. They played nine innings of a game. It was a tie, and it was too dark to play anymore, so they called the game. And then they went on after that to win 14 more games. So first off, I say it's not a 26-game winning streak. It would be a 27-game unbeaten streak because there was a tie in there. And then on the other side, the argument for Elias had been, well, they tied three times that year, and the ties are not put in the standings. They're basically just – Going to thin air. Right. Which seems somewhat amazing. As still that. happens, it should be pointed out that in 2015, the Indians finished the season 81-80. and 80. They had one game that was, it was not concluded. They didn't replay it. And so in the standings, they only have 161 games and 162 okay. games scheduled. So, to their point, okay, I can see that. But this, this wasn't one of those five innings where they didn't reach the right. legal thing. This was a nine-inning game right. that was called and it was a tie. Three ties that year. So here's where you lose me. Those three ties that they didn't count in the standings, all those statistics, from what I've been led to believe, unless Steve Hurt is going to tell me different, count for the players as far as the year accumulating through the year. So you're having your cake and eating it too. You're you're not counting that in the standings, but you're letting the players have the statistics. So, So what gives? Honus Wagner was in that game, by the way, and the 1916 Giants featured, among others, Heine Zimmerman, Heine Stafford, yeah. Sailor Stroud, High Pockets Kelly, Paul Parrott, and Slim Sally. They Couple had two Heines, for crying out loud. Couple of Heines. So that's where you lose me. If you want to get me over to that side a little bit and say we don't count those games at all, I can start to see it. But you're counting the statistics, the stats from those three ties. You're letting the players have them. They count for the game. They count for the year. You lose me there. As far as I'm concerned, that should count then. It is an unbeaten streak, not a winning streak. Let the debate begin. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. Pick from a range of coverage options with the Name Your Price tool to find a price that works for you again. All of this stems from the Cleveland Indians. They're playing great ball. Who have won 20 straight games and have an afternoon game today in which they could make it 21. Our friend Steve Hurt from the Elias Sports Bureau is standing by, and he is ready to join us now on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Good morning, Steve Hurt. Good morning, Mike and Mike. How are you? Good, Steve. We're doing great. So let me set this up so there will be no prejudicing of the of the jury here. Okay. So the Indians yeah, please have... do, because although I'm a regular listener... Uh... Uh, of all the mornings not to have this show on, uh, I'm, you have to catch me up on what, what's been said. Okay. Okay, yes, you've been a little part of the conversation today. A little bit. So here's, here's what's happened. The Indians have won 20 straight games. The record, according to the Elias Sports Bureau, is 26 set by the 1916 Giants. Golick is arguing it should be 21 games set by the 1935 Cubs because there was a tie that fell in the middle of the 26-game win streak of the 1916 Giants. We read earlier your explanation of why the tie does not interfere with a win streak. For those just joining us now, can you please explain your side of that? Okay, so um, <clears throat> tie games in baseball, what, what a topic. What a topic to be discussed on baseball or radio in, in uh, 2017. Yeah. But it used to be that tie games happened in baseball because there were no lights and because the there was... Uh, there weren't tarpaulins in every stadium like they have now. So when there'd be rain, sometimes the game would just have to end for the day. Um, when tie games happened, they were always replayed. A tie game was never an acceptable ending to a baseball game any time, that day to this. 
unlike in hockey and football, now you have to go back to the pre-overtime mentality in hockey and football because both sports have since uh, incorporated overtime periods to try to get a winner in each game. Um, but it used to be that uh, when we were all kids in hockey and in football, if the game ended in a tie, that was an acceptable result of the game. And uh, when you looked in the standings in the newspaper, you'd see every team had a record that incorporated wins, losses, and ties. That was different in baseball. You never saw wins, losses, and ties in baseball standings because when there was one of these oddball tie games, it would be immediately replayed the next day usually to get a legitimate decision, a one or a loss. And, in fact, that's what happened with the 1916 Giants, um, which uh, the whole uh, incident, the tie game, occurred uh, 101 years ago this week. Uh, so the Giants, uh, in the second game of a doubleheader, uh, it rained during the ninth inning. The umpire called the game off while the score was tied 1-1. So instead of playing a single game the next day, they played a doubleheader. So the Giants had to find another pitcher, so did Pittsburgh. And uh, the Giants won the doubleheader and went on with their streak. Today, if that same thing happened, that would be a suspended game, and they would pick it up from the point of the next day. I, I guess it took a, a while to get to that point. To, uh, to, to regard those games as suspended games. But that is, that's basically the story. And in baseball, a tie game has always been ignored uh, in terms of winning and losing streaks. Um, that was the case uh, in 1916 with the Giants. And um, it's been the case from that day to this. That is okay, an excellent. So, so let so, me just so, say, what, what, that's what, an excellent explanation. What, what, let me just ask this question. So that game, you're telling us because we couldn't find this anywhere. You're telling us that game that was a tie that was replayed right. the next day or finished the next day, and the Giants won it. Well, it was it wasn't picked up at the point. It was it was started over from the beginning. Seems a little crazy by today's standards. I'll admit. The, the whole idea of a suspended game where you pick it up right from the point where it was stopped, that was not yet in vogue in 1916. They hadn't yet come to that point in uh, human development. So, <laughs> oh, okay. we, we, so, so it was so another game was played that made up for that game. To, to replace the tie game. Okay, you win. That's it. That's it. It's over. It's over. It wins. We, we didn't know that part of it. We didn't. You win. No, we didn't. And, and Steve wins. I mean, that's it. Yeah. By the way, Steve, do the statistics from the from the, that game count? Like Honus Wagner, for example, played in that game, and I we haven't found the yes. stats from that game. Yes. Do those yes. they count? That, that was an that was an odd thing. But think of it. You know, think of it this time. I, I, a friend of mine uh, was having trouble understanding the point the other day, and I said, "Well, think of a pitcher who has a a winning streak going. Think of a pitcher who has a winning streak going." Now he pitches in a game after he, say, won 10 straight games. Now he pitches in a game where he gets neither the win nor the loss. He gets a no decision, as I like to say now. His winning streak still uh, continues into his next outing because there was neither a win nor a loss there to break the streak. So that, that at least clarified it for one friend of mine. I don't know if it'll clarify it for, uh, for an entire radio audience here. I, I don't think I agree with that. I don't think you can have a nine-inning, one-one tie if you continued the game from the ninth inning, and then there was, there, there, there was that one game. But they played an entire new game. So basically, you're saying a nine-inning game, one-one tie didn't count for anything, but those statistics counted even though they replayed the game entirely. That, I'm not going to lie, I don't agree with. I don't think those stats should count. Well, that's that what they game. did. I mean, that, that's a matter of historical historical record. That's, 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 that's the way they handled it. Then, as I say, today, uh, you remember most famously, and there was a World Series game a couple of years ago between Philadelphia and uh, Tampa Bay, right. where it was tied uh, and it started to rain so heavily that uh, they couldn't play anymore that night. And they came back two days later and picked it up from the exact point where they did it. And they had a full house. It was the World Series, of course. And people came back to, to, to see the end of the game. I think probably the feeling back in, at the turn of the century when people weren't getting crowds of 40,000 at baseball game typically was if they, if they ever picked it up the next day, um, who, who would come back to, to see uh, two innings of baseball or something like that, you know. Um, so I get that I, thought process. You won this battle, but I would like – those statistics in that tie game one one to not count. I would like to get some victory in this, so I would like you to go back and wipe out those. Steve, statistics. can you do that? Do you have that authority, Mike? How about Mike puts out the Golick record book, I mean, and yeah. in that record book, 
those statistics can be expunged, and then you'll have to deal with uh, Hannes Wagner and two guys named Heine. <laughs> you know what? You know what, Steve? I would do that, but it sounds like an awful lot of work. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but we, it was an excellent use of expunged. All right. Steve, that is extraordinarily well done. Yes, it is. Thank you very yep. much for being there and for all of the help that you always give us with all of the statistical information, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Steve Thanks, Hart. Steve. Have a great day, guys. That's Mike and Mike. That's Steve Hurt. We're presented by Progressive Insurance. So, I mean, he ended the debate. And I I give you credit for just acknowledging he's right. Let's get on with our day. Even if they, the next day, continued from the ninth inning and it was a 1-1, if they finished it, it would be fine. Well, no, but they would. If they had finished it, there would have been a result. Is that's the what point. I'm, no, that's what I'm saying. And if the Giants, yeah, oh, exactly, there would have been would a have result. So five. if they had won, there never would have been a tie. The yeah, point right. is, the tie doesn't count. The tie doesn't count. But my my point is, if they didn't replay it, I would have the issue. Yeah. But they replayed. That if they game, did replay it, you'd be right. I would be right. I would absolutely be right. The game would end in a tie. But this, that's one part of it we did not know. Uh, that, uh, and I'll blame Hembo for that. Um, and I'll throw him under the bus. We did not know they replayed that in game in its, in its entirety and the Giants won. Therefore, I do recognize a couple of Heinies, a Sailor, a Slim, and a High Pockets. High Pockets Kelly, who by the yeah. way is in the Hall of Fame. Well, there you go. Really sent me a note. High Pockets and, Kelly is in the Hall of and Fame. And all their teammates as having the best win streak. In baseball. Yeah, in Boy, history. Well, but you got six games to catch them. No, I know. I mean, the Indians right are going to be right there. My point is, I am saying I, I accept accept what Steve had to say, and I accept the statistic as it is. All right, that was very well done on his part. We are Mike and Mike. Um, let me give you one quick thing on that, and then we'll do next question, because I can't even imagine, if I was on a team that won 20 consecutive games, and I, I've never, you know, I don't even know what I would compare that to in my life. If, if, if I were to play golf and, and break 80 20 consecutive times, which I've done in my life five times. So, I mean, it would be quite a remarkable streak. I can't imagine the level of superstition that I would rise to and all the things I'd be doing the same way and all the things I'd be thinking about. So Terry Francona, after last night's win, was asked about that, about any superstitions he has going with 20 consecutive wins. I got one really good buddy, one of my best friends, but he's notoriously... Bad luck. Everybody kind of refers to him as like the gray cloud. He knows who he is. And I, that's, you know, you talk about superstitions. I will not talk to him. He is a text only. Oh, yeah, he knows. Cost me one job. He's not getting away again. <laughs> that's awesome. That is an awesome story. I love that. And I never had a streak when I was playing that, that I did a lot of the same things anyway, but that was just kind of out of habit. I didn't, I didn't feel. If I didn't, oh, my God, I'm not going to have a good game. But I never had a streak to say, oh, I have to do the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> but I was part of a streak. When I lived in Arizona and the kids were very, very young, we're talking seven years old, eight years old in mm-hmm. that area there. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, along with, with uh, 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 Jeff Fiegel's son, CJ, was on the team as well, and others, that we had a basketball team that we coached. They were called the Pulverizers. And we went undefeated that year. Okay. Won the championship, 12-0. and 0. And, you know, so you ask if you do the same thing. I remember specifically before that season started in the first game, you know, the wife and I. Huh. So we won, and I said, hey, you know. How'd that work? Well, 12 games later. Did she buy that? You know, no, not at all. I was going to say. No, not one bit. Does that work? I tried. <laughs> that, I said, hey, hon, remember when? That's a really creative way yeah. of going about yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> all right, Mike and Mike, congratulations, all kidding aside, to the Indians. Yeah. It's an incredible yeah. streak. They've they've outscored their opponents in, over the 20 wins 102 to nothing. It, it, it is. They haven't lost a game since crazy. August 23rd. And I think another one is about jumping on a team early in the first three innings. Of these games, they've outscored their opponents 64 to 12. So they're just jumping all over these teams. All right, let's do next question here. And the first one involves the Indian. Next question brought to you by Indeed.com. Post your next job opening on the world's number one job site. First question, which streak is more significant, the Indians' 20-game winning streak or the Dodgers' 11-game losing streak, which, by the well, way, they snapped last night. I think night. I leaned, looked toward the Dodgers because they were so dominant for most of the season. That, and you just thought they were going to cruise their way to the World Series. And they may, you know, hit a valley here and there, a peak and a, and a valley. But 
did you expect an 11 game losing streak valley i know i didn't so while a 20 game win streak is fantastic and i think they're going to keep going given the season the dodgers have had of winning so much and being so dominant to then flip the script that badly and lose that many games in a row is it was pretty amazing to me i'm going to go the other way because in terms of actual significance the Indians, with their win streak, have taken over the number one seed in the American League. The Dodgers, with their losing streak, did not lose the number one seed right. in the National League. It could actually be more consequential to the Indians. Who would you say there's more pressure on now to win the whole thing this year? The Indians Dodgers. because of their 20-game the, win the streak season the, the Dodgers? Dodgers. For the season the Dodgers have had, I know they hit, obviously, this big-time hiccup here. Uh, but I, I still think on the Dodgers. Well, the, 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 the Indians are not that far behind them. Let on me the see. Dodgers. Move on. The Dodgers. The Dodgers. It's on the Dodgers. Okay, they have the enough. pressure. <laughs> Quit putting pressure on Cleveland. Next question. Thank you. The bigger problem in the NFL right now, is it quarterback play or offensive line play? Well, I mean, play? so many things happen. You know, quarterback touches the ball every play, so you have, to, you have to look at what they do. But they're protected by the O-line. If you want to have a better passing game, it's good to have a great running game or a good running game. You need an offensive line for that. So the offensive line play, because a lot of this stems from college systems to the NFL, the preparedness of quarterbacks to offensive line play. You know, in a quarterback, you have one person, you know, and you try and have them grow as a quarterback. And for the offensive line, there there is no other position where multiple human beings have to work in unison more than the offensive line. And if one guy is off, that could wreak havoc. So I think the offensive line has been very, very spotty. And you see the biggest difference on good offensive line of just how much that's going to help a team. So I I'd think, lean there. And I, th- I think that the struggles at both position – both positions stem from the same thing, which is the difference in the style and the way the game is being yeah. played in college versus the pros. I think the quarterbacks actually are, are in a more advantageous position because they can hand the ball off no matter what. Yeah. The offensive linemen, if they're not accustomed to getting down in that stance and blocking the way they need to in the NFL, how do you even project these guys to tough. the pros? Very, very tough. That's I why mean, you wind up with these number one picks who can't play. Yeah, it's very difficult. That's why, you know... There's not looking at stats, you know, for statistical position, but for O-line, you really got to hone in on how much they're in their stance, what kind of steps do they have, how are their fundamentals that can translate off to the next level. Uh, To me, that is the bigger problem and the more lasting one in the NFL. Next question of the teams that currently have sole possession of first place in their division, and there are only three, the Bills, the Jaguars, and the Rams, which is the likeliest wow. to make the playoffs? You know, you sit there and look at, at Jacksonville in that division, and you say, mm, you want to kind of hide the quarterback, you want to have a good running game, and you want to win on defense. Well, that's kind of Houston right now, right? You don't want to put too much on Deshaun Watson's shoulders. I think he's going to be, be the starter. You don't want to put a lot on him. Right. You want to be able to run the ball. The old line has some issues there, and you're relying on a great defense, but you didn't see it in the first game. You saw it with Jacksonville. The Rams, I mean, you're dealing with Seattle out there. Cardinals just lost David Johnson. That really, really hurts them. The Bills, I don't know. I, 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 do, I just don't see it yet. Out of, I'm actually going to lean would lean toward Jacksonville. I would lean toward the Rams. I think the Rams are the team of this group that has the best chance to make the playoffs. The Bills, I think, are not. The Bills played the Jets. I, I, I get that the Rams played the Colts, but the Rams annihilated the Colts. The Bills and the Jets, I mean, the Jets coached their way out of a chance to win that game. I I think the Rams, with improved quarterback play, they played without Aaron Donald, their best players coming back. I'm not saying I think they will make the playoffs, but of these three, I would pick them. Next question. Lonzo Ball being ranked ahead of Carmelo Anthony in ESPN.com's rankings is blank. I I always have a problem. This Again, you know, I've had my issues in talking about LeVar from from – the talking standpoint, not starting his own business and all that, but the talking standpoint has nothing to do with the kid. He looks, to, to me, his vision of the court and the way he moves the ball and gets teammates involved is fantastic. But I have a problem with ranking players who have never touched the field yet, touched the hard court, touched the ice, touched anything, to 
rank them in there. So I, I have an overall fundamental problem with these kind of rankings anyway. That's not to say that at this point, listen, Carmelo's coming to the end of his career. I mean, he just is. And Lonzo is just starting his career on what looks to be a promising career, but it's still got the P word on it more than anything else, and that's potential. So overall, I have a problem with people who haven't even stepped on their particular field yet being in these rankings. Yeah, look, I mean, if you were drafting right now, you would take Lonzo Ball ahead of Carmelo Anthony in the big picture sure because he's yes. at the very beginning yeah. and Carmelo is closer right. to the end. Right. Do I think Lonzo Ball will be a more effective NBA player in this coming season than Carmelo? I don't think it's ridiculous. Oh, I don't think it's ridiculous either. Not. No, 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 I don't either. So from the ranking standpoint, I, I get it. I can see him being ranked ahead of Carmelo. I'm, I'm just not a 64 fan 64 feels awfully low, though, for Carmelo. For Carmelo. I mean, very, very low. First time skydiving? Sure is. Okay, you just open the door like this and you jump. Yeah, wait, wait. Should, should we be like in tandem? Tandem? That's a great idea. Uh, are you a certified instructor? No, but I love parachutes and I love people. Here we go. <laughs> you wouldn't take chances with an uncertified skydiving instructor. Don't do 